and I started hating my show. I started hating my job. I started hating myself. And I actually like went on a really deep, dark path of depression and I had a terrible eating disorder and I was in a toxic relationship. And then it all kind of ended with the show being canceled and me having to start over. I was forced to really take a hard look at who I was. I was forced to shift. I was forced to take action in a different way. We have a lot of cases where people will try to go into the entrepreneurship space. They'll start something, but after hearing 200, 300 no's, they kind of get worn down. If like you could fail with nobody watching, no one had any idea that you failed, you'd try a lot more stuff. Like you, you'd be out there a lot more because it wouldn't be as high risk. Jen Gottlieb is a powerhouse entrepreneur, international speaker, and the co-founder of Super Connector Media. It recently made the Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing private companies in America. Jen has been named one of the top 50 speakers in the world by Real Leaders Magazine. She is the author of Be Seen, Find Your Voice, Build Your Brand, Live Your Dream, a national bestseller that's empowering people to step into their spotlight. I made it through and it forced me to up level and it forced me to change my life the more that we can move through it to the other side and get from the shit to the shift. It was 100% necessary to have that temporary discomfort and that temporary depression and that temporary low. The, the most growth does not come from the easy times. That like, It just doesn't. If you look back at your life, it's always from the hardest times. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Over the last year, 86.6% of our regular viewers have not yet hit the subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It's a small gesture on your end and a huge leap forward for our channel. If you wouldn't mind, we would love to ask you if you found our channel informative and engaging, if you can please hit that subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It allows us to go ahead and continue to put out great content, better guests, and as always, we will always put out two episodes per week. Thank you so much. Jen, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So excited to be here. Yeah, I wanted to start the conversation by first kind of talking about acting. My wife used to be an actor before she transitioned into the corporate world. But my first question is, many people would think that transitioning from acting into the world of entrepreneurship sounds like a significant shift, but there's actually so many transferable skills between the two. I personally think there's so many overlapping things from an actor and being an entrepreneur, but were there any key skills or lessons that you learned from your acting career that kind of shifted over into the entrepreneurship space? A thousand percent. I actually, now that I look back, I really realize how much of a little mini entrepreneur I was when I was an actor, because you are always marketing yourself. You're always selling yourself every single day, and you're always figuring out how to get essentially the next client. So you could look at acting like a business, like it is my acting business and my next client is my next job. And I have to sell myself and market myself in order to be chosen to get that next job. So I was always having that, that little bit of business entrepreneurship mentality. But the number one lesson that I learned from being an actress, there's a couple of them, but the number one that I, I bring with me now every single day of my life is how to have a better relationship with rejection. Because what I've learned now as an entrepreneur is something that is 100% certain is that I'm going to get rejected pretty way, way, way more than I'm going to get a win, way more than I'm going to get a yes. Whether that means a failure in something right. that I'm trying to do or maybe um, getting rejected from a, a, a potential client, a potential partnership, a potential speaking engagement, a potential uh, investor, absolutely anything that I'm doing in business, there is a higher chance of rejection than there is of, uh, yes, we absolutely want to work with you. And I'm really, I have to say, like, I'm not good at a ton of things. I'm really good at this thing. I'm really good at hearing no. And I'm really good at how having that rejection really turn into redirection and fuel me in order to get the yes in a different way. And the only reason I'm good at that is because I spent years just getting rejected every day, multiple times a day from going from audition right. to audition to audition. You're not good enough. You're not tall enough. You're not blonde enough. You're not this enough. And just, it, it just, uh, when you hear it over and over and over again, 
uh, it becomes a lot easier to understand that that's a part of life. And so I'm so grateful that I moved into this career now as an entrepreneur and business owner and speaker and author where you get heard no just as much with these lessons ingrained in me because I, I truly do believe that it's really, really helped me to move past it a lot faster than the majority of entrepreneurs in our space uh, because I have all that experience of hearing no. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, honestly, being able to face rejection and continue trying and trying, I think is one of the top, top qualities that anyone needs to be an entrepreneur. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times we got rejected, but you can't ever succeed in your first shot or second shot or third. You know, people are going to always say no. And those entrepreneurs that you hear stories about are good at facing rejections, or they don't at least, maybe they're not good about it, but they never let them stop it, right? We have a lot of cases where people will try to go into the entrepreneurship space, they'll start something, but after hearing 200, 300 no's, they kind of get worn down, which is very understandable, right? Imagine, it, it, let's just say you're a company, you're, you're trying to raise startup funds. 300 no's is, is a lot. How many VCs do you have to pitch to Right, exactly, exactly. So that, that and that, right away when I saw that, I was, I was like, you know, a Jen must be a master at when she hears no. Like, you know, any rejections, it's like, all right, it's fine, let's move on. But I will say, getting rejected still hurts. I don't know. Is how about for you, Vlad, and how about for you, Jen? Right, it still hurts. It hurts. It, it, it's just, uh, you know, this, this point of that actors and and entrepreneurs have a lot in common made me think why. Why in schools, in business school, they not, you know, teach you acting? Actually, it would mm. be very nice to have in a business school the acting acting oh, classes good. because every time you go to any business meeting, you have to act. And every business yeah. meeting is different from each other. Uh, on one, you have to be strong. On another one, you have to be soft and vice versa. So you have to know how to, how to behave. Actually, it's a very nice point. Is, uh, did you... Yeah, I, I, would, I would actually disagree on that and i would go in another direction with that but before i do i do want to tell you my trick for uh rejection which i think that your listeners actually might enjoy and they might want to do it for themselves i, I love giving uh tangible tactical advice that people can use so what i do now to help me with the rejections it's this weird thing that i started doing that is like really helpful because i noticed that when i look back at my acting career or i look back at my career and i connect the dots as to why i got a no for something it was secretly just because i was supposed to get a yes for something else because if i would have gotten a yes for that thing. Mm. Maybe it wouldn't have opened the opportunity for something better eventually to come along. So to remind myself of that, I actually have this album in my iPhone in my photos that's called rejection emails. And it's not just emails, it's text messages now too. But every time I get rejected or I fail at something or somebody tells me no, or I don't get the thing that I wanted, usually it's in the form of a text message or in an email. And I screenshot it and I put it into my rejection album and I go back and I read them all the time. And I read them to help me have a better relationship with them. Because I feel like if I can giggle and laugh and be like, oh yeah, you're telling me no now, but I bet I'm gonna look back at this email years from now and understand why this was a no because it was secretly leading me to something else. And the cool thing is, is I have been able to to go into that album now that I've been doing it for so long and look at some of the emails that I got years ago that were, you know, no, we're, we're going to pass. And then those same people reached out to me later on and said, you know what, we're just kidding. We want to reach out now because I've grown and I've developed my career a little bit more. I'm at a position where I'm a little bit re more ready for that opportunity. So it's, it's a really cool thing to do to help just in, uh, make your relationship with rejection a little bit better, a little bit more fun, a little bit more playful. Like this is what's going to happen anyway. So why don't I collect all of these? And then I can say things like, oh, you know what? When you want me back next year, I'm going to be a lot more expensive. So you know what? It's fine. I'm going to mm -hmm. screenshot this. I'm going to save it for a rainy day. I'm going to read it and I'm going to laugh and giggle at it. But I will, Vlad, I want to make a point with what you said about acting in meetings. Yeah. So one thing that I have learned um, over my entire journey of being an actress and always portraying somebody that I thought everybody else needed me to be in my life. I was on a TV show about heavy metal music for five years, and I don't like heavy metal music <laughs> at all. So for five years, I had this really great job, this really great gig on this popular TV show on a popular network. And the, the crazy thing was about this is that I wasn't necessarily playing a character. It was a talk show. So I was being myself, but I was playing a version of myself that wasn't real. It was a fake version of me. And it was a version of me where I was acting and pretending to be somebody that I thought I needed to be for all of these people that were watching the show and the producers and the network and everything to, to like me and to 
believe in whatever I was doing and to choose me and to make me feel important and to make me feel valued. And what ended up happening as a result of that is not being myself and not just being exactly who I am and being authentic to me was that I ended up building a brand and a quote unquote business uh, based around something that was a lie. And a lot of bad things happen when you do that. Number one, you are, I was unbelievably exhausted because I was trying to keep up with this version of myself that wasn't real. And when you have to do that, that's really tiring and, and it's not authentic. And so it feels exhausting every day. And then number two, I had this audience of people that liked me for something that wasn't me. So I was essentially mm. inauthentic within myself and with them. And it just didn't work. It didn't click. And every day I woke up and I was in this constant battle within my real self. Like, what's going to happen when this show goes away? Who am I really? And it's so hard for me to keep up this face of being somebody that I'm not and, and being a person that's not, not who I am. How am I going to keep doing this forever and ever and ever? And I started hating my show. I started hating my job. I started hating myself. And I actually like went on a really deep, dark path of depression. And I had a terrible eating disorder and I was in a toxic relationship. And then it all kind of ended with the show being canceled and me having to start over. And I do believe that in business, especially today, when you're building a brand and you're showing up in meetings and you're showing up on podcasts and you're showing up on stages or you're in a, in a meeting trying to raise money, you always want to be your most authentic self. You don't want to act. You don't right. want to be a character. You don't want to be somebody that you're not. Because if you do that, you're going to attract opportunities that aren't in alignment with who you really are. You're going to attract partnerships that aren't in alignment with who you really are. And you're going to wake up one day, years from there, and you're like, oh my God, this is not good. I don't like it. And I don't like my business. And I don't like my job and I don't like who I am and I need to start over. So I always say that you need to be you. You need to be seen as exactly who you are, be true to who you are. And those opportunities that aren't for you, that's great. That's amazing. They're going to go find somebody else that's more in alignment with them. And don't act and pretend and try to be somebody that you're not for other people. It never ends up uh, being a win. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. No, oh, hundred percent. Sorry, agree. 100%. I'm going to. No, no, no. <laughs> it, it, w w what I meant it, it was not you have to pretend to be somebody else. What I meant is to be able even to present yourself who you really are, because this is really because this yeah, is really hard. Does a great job in teaching you communication right. skills. How to present? How to how to handle yourself in a stressful situations? Because a lot of people when it's stress they just forget the information they just you know they don't want to appear there they just want to lay down in their bed not even going to take the meeting or you know so this kind of training would help entrepreneurs in their business this is what i meant definitely like developing confidence being able to get in front of people and speak in front right. of people a hundred percent i agree yeah. with that part and also i wanted to add to the point that um that we that we have a fear that we have a fear of rejection. Usually, I think it comes from the uh, from the childhood. We have it because every time when child comes to us, I have to I have two kids, and a lot of time I also do these mistakes. Every time they trying to ask me something, I say no. And every time you, you they get rejected, 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 and this is where all this rejection fear comes from from the childhood. And a lot of parents don't realize it, that you have to allow your kids to do some stuff to make their own mistakes. So they are not afraid of being rejected in, in the long run. Yeah, I don't have kids, so I can't relate, but I definitely can relate to when I was a kid, 100%. Um, and the, we never like hearing no, but I, I, I honestly think that um, we don't, we're not necessarily as afraid of hearing no, uh, as we are afraid of people knowing that we got the no, like people seeing that we got rejected. I think that's a bigger fear for people, especially in today's day and age than anything else, because if you could fail and get rejected in private, it wouldn't be as painful. It wouldn't sting as bad if nobody knew about it. Right. If like you could fail with nobody watching, and no one had any idea that you failed, you'd try a lot more stuff. Like you, you'd be out there a lot more because right. it wouldn't be as high risk. So I think people are, yes, exactly what you just said, Vlad. I'm sure there's a ton of stuff from childhood that seeps in a ton, uh, but as well as like just fear of judgment, fear of people uh, like 
thinking that you're not good enough. When the crazy thing is, is that what I've noticed is I'm definitely not perfect in this. I, I definitely care what people think sometimes. And I definitely fear judgment sometimes. And I definitely fear all of those things that everybody else in the world does. But what I've started to realize is that nobody's really paying that much attention. <laughs> Nobody is. Everybody's consumed with themselves. Actually, my 14 year old stepdaughter always reminds me of this. She's always like, nobody's judging you, Jen. Everyone's just worried about their, themselves. Everybody and if they're judging you, yeah, that's true. It's just a. It, it's just something that they're dealing with in themselves. They were activated for something that they saw that you did because it it triggered something within them, and that would be the only reason that they're judging. So, and also, what I would say to people that are worried about random people on the internet judging them for being seen or putting themselves out there or building their business is I've never met a happy, successful person that spends any time on the internet commenting negatively on other people's stuff ever. And so mm -hmm. I just, instead of feeling bad for me that I got a negative comment, I think about that person. And I, I, I'm like, I feel really bad for that person because they must be not so happy if they're going to go take their time to try to make other people feel bad. So it's never really about you. <laughs> it's always about the other person. 100%. Um, this is a good moment to transition to my next question about your philosophy. And I actually really like it because it resonates with my philosophy. So your philosophy is shit happens so that shift can happen. And you shared your own personal challenges like canceling of your show and the difficult breakup before you realize this philosophy. Could you please walk us through this process? What was happening in your headspace? Yeah, I, the philosophy of sometimes shit happens so the shift can happen is what I've just noticed from every single bad thing that's ever happened in my life. And and it doesn't make the bad things any less bad. And I know we, we mentioned that when we were talking about rejection, like it stings, it hurts, it's never fun. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, you need to love it and it's just going to feel good and remove all the negative feelings that come with it. Actually, being able to experience the negative feelings of rejection or failure and being able to get to the other side of them is what creates growth and resiliency. And so in order for me to get to the point of get to where I am today, I had to experience everything blowing up. I had to experience the shit hitting the fan in order for me to shift. My back was against the wall. Like I was not living in alignment. I was not a happy girl. I was not making powerful in, in, in choices that were um, with, with like that had any like I was not even into personal development at all back in the day when I was on VH1 at mm -hmm. all. Like I, I didn't even know what a podcast was. I had never read any personal development books really other than The Secret, which my mom forced me to read. And and I was into that, but that was about it. And so when everything went away, because I was living in authentically and I was really not taking care of myself, I was forced to really take a hard look at who I was. I was forced to shift. I was forced to take action in a different way. And because I did, it changed my entire life. And if it wasn't for the breakup, if it wasn't for the show getting canceled, if it wasn't for that rock bottom moment, if it wasn't for that really deep, dark depression and all of those things that happened to me, I probably would have never sought out another answer. I would have never sought out the path that I went on in order to build the life that I've built. So yes, that was a terrible time in my life. And I don't wish that on anyone and I would never want to go through through that again. But when I look back at it, it was a hundred percent necessary to have that temporary discomfort and that temporary depression and that temporary low in order to get to where I am today, because it equipped me also. It equipped me with the tools that I need today for something like that happening again, because now I can look back and I have that proof. Oh, I went through the hardest of hard times back in the day and I made it through. I did. It sucked. I made it through and it forced me to up level and it forced me to change my life. And and so now I, I'm sure, look, I'm 37 years old within the, the rest of my life, there's going to be other things that happen because that's the only thing that's certain is that there is no certainty and there are going to be things in life that happen that really suck. But the more proof that we have that we can move through those difficult times uh, and something good will happen eventually on the other side because of it, some form of growth, some amazing relationship that you're supposed to create, some really cool business or a great idea that was supposed to be spawned from that terrible moment. You do realize that eventually. And when you can look back and connect the dots looking backwards, it always makes sense. And it makes you a more equipped, more confident person moving forward to be able to deal with any of the hard shit, with any of the shit that happens, because you know that eventually it's going to force you to shift. So that's how I feel about it. It doesn't make the negative moments in life any yeah. more fun. They're not. But, <laughs> but it is my reminder to me that I'm not going to grow if I'm not able to experience the hard times, the difficult times. Unfortunately, that's where the most, most growth comes. The, the most growth does not come from the easy times. 
that. Yeah. It just doesn't. If you look back at your mm. life, it's always from the hardest times. So for all those people who are listening right now, who have shit happening in their life at this moment, so what would be the steps for them to overcome that, that shit, mm -hmm. just to, just to, just to enjoy it, just to cry in the bed, just to wait until it's going to run away or <laughs> what are the, yeah. the, the steps? I, I'm not a mental health expert, and so I don't know the exact steps, but I can share with you what I've learned from my experience. And I can share with you the steps that I would take now moving through it again, or that I would consistently remind myself to now, even when things happen to me um, in this moment is number one, to allow yourself to, to feel it. I think that for a very long time, I tried to run away from all negative feelings and I'm in therapy regularly. I'm blessed enough to have this awesome therapist. And this is what we work on is actually feeling the feelings and not trying to numb out, not thinking that it's terrible. And I'm the only one in the world that experiences negative feelings to be able to understand and know that those feelings that I'm feeling or whatever's going on is going to happen. And it's going to pass. This too shall pass. Time never stops. And that discomfort that you're experiencing is only temporary. And what I've learned is that if I can embrace it, it's not always easy, but I track and put my arm around it. And it, let's say I'm feeling anxiety or I'm feeling fear or I'm feeling something that's unbelievably uncomfortable. If I can allow it in and allow myself to feel it and allow myself to get even more curious about it, where do I feel this in my body? Why, is this true? Am I really feeling this because of a, a fear that I've created and a story I've created or is this really happening? And if so, like, can I just sit in this moment? And then most importantly, above all, is, is to seek out help if you need help. We're not meant to do this alone. That's why I truly believe in the power of community and connection and having people in your circle and in your world and in your life that care about you that you can go to. Whether that is a paid professional, which I definitely have, or a community of amazing friends and, and partners and people in your life that support you. Uh, I am such a big proponent of talking it out and announcing the elephant in the room and being vulnerable enough to share what's really going on. I go live on Instagram every single morning, every morning. I put my makeup on. It's called Get Ready With Me. I do it every single day. And I make sure that on those Instagram lives, I don't necessarily say, let's say I'm going through something unbelievably, terribly traumatic and it's not ready to be shared. I don't talk about that, but I definitely talk about the real feelings that I'm experiencing just so that people don't feel alone if they're struggling. I think one of the biggest problems is that people think that they're struggling by themselves alone because they're scrolling social media and they're looking at highlight reels of everybody's mm -hmm. perfect lives. And they're just seeing a snapshot of something awesome that happened, but you have no idea what's really going on behind the scenes. So when people are struggling, they feel like they're struggling alone. So I do my best to get on live and be like, listen, this is what I went through yesterday. Like I felt so anxious. I couldn't sleep. You know, I don't necessarily need to share the experience of what happened if it's not ready to be shared. I don't think that that's a good idea, but being open about what you're feeling and understanding and knowing that these are normal feelings that humans have and they are temporary and they suck and they're no fun. But the more that we can come together and be connected and talk about it and talk to each other and reach out for help, that's the most important thing. Ask for help. You're not alone. The more that we can move through it to the other side and get from the shit to the shift. Yeah. You know, I, I love the point when you said that you have to enjoy and understand your feelings. I also went through the breakup and I know at that time, oh my God, I was enjoying my, my stress. I was crying every day, but I was enjoying, <laughs> but my, but my, but my tip would be to exercise at that time for yep. me personally, the exercising, this is what helped me really because I, I was doing exercises like six hours a day, every day for two, three months, instead of, you know, just going to the bars, crying, drinking going more down i agree that's, that's a lot of time day. six hours a yeah, day exercise i i, I need i needed because i was i was you, you can't imagine how i was crying did you do anything else six hours a day please <laughs> yeah jen i want to talk a little bit more uh, more about your company's super connector media yeah. now you've successfully built a strong personal brand i want to kind of start off first with can you address what are some common misconceptions that people have about building a personal brand? And I know one of the key points we hit on already was the authenticity part, but are there any other uh, common misconceptions about starting a personal brand? Yeah. So there's a couple, I mean, there's actually quite a few misconceptions. Um, 
if you're starting a personal brand, so first things first is you do not have to have a personal brand. It is highly recommended. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. If you are building a business that you build a personal brand alongside it for so many reasons, but you don't absolutely have to. If you do choose to create a personal brand and, and, and you do take my advice, because if I give any advice, I would advise you to build a personal brand if you are an entrepreneur building a business, or if at one point in time ever you want to raise capital or um, what I'm noticing is you guys are in the space of uh, education and children. And what I'm noticing is a lot of moms that uh, mom friends that I have is they're building personal brands for their kids hockey for their kids soccer for their kids football so they can get into better schools they all have instagrams and personal mm -hmm. brands i really do believe that we're entering a world where your personal brand online is what's going to be like the opportunity generator for you in absolutely any space so right. I do believe that my advice to you is if you don't want to, fine, that's totally okay. Uh, but you, if you want to get ahead, you should. So that's number one. Number two, uh, I think that people think that their, their personal brand needs to be completely niched. And it needs to be totally focused on the only thing that their business does. Like I've had many, we teach coaches and business owners how to build profitable brands online through our masterminds and our events. And so we get a lot of experts and authors and speakers that come to us or people with service-based industries like coaches. And the one of the main questions I get is like, okay, I'm, an, I'm a yoga expert. And can I ever talk about the fact that I play the guitar? This is just an example. Or do I have to just have all of my posts be all about yoga? I'm really in a rut. Like all my posts are about yoga. And what I say to them, them is that the thing that separates you from every other yoga instructor is not because you can do a better downward dog. There's always going to be somebody that's going to do a better downward dog than you. There's always going to be somebody that does the exact same thing as you and probably does it better. But here's the thing that I can guarantee. There is only one you, the way you speak, your hobbies, your story, your unique uh, situation at home, the things that you like to do, the way that you communicate. This law goes back to why you shouldn't act in business and in meetings, because the thing that's going to make you stand out, the thing that's going to make certain people attracted to just you as their yoga expert and not somebody else is maybe because you're an awesome guitarist and you play these amazing songs and they love it because they're also a musician and they do yoga too. And they love your music too. Or for me, right. like I talk about a lot of things. I, I, I wrote a book called Be Seen and I teach branding and I teach entrepreneurship and I teach visibility and mindset, but I also love talking about manifesting. I also have three dogs and I'm a New Yorker. I also love to work out and lift heavy weights. Uh, I also love to watch baking shows, even though I don't bake. I also love to watch 90 Day Fiance. Like there are all these things about me that make people like, oh my gosh, Jen, me too, me too. And so I, I like to tell people that your personal brand can number one, evolve with you. So you don't always have to be niched in and stay exactly where you are. People love to come along the journey and watch your brand evolve and watch yourself grow. So if you go from being a yoga instructor to being a personal development coach, that's A-OK. -okay. Take people along for the journey. You don't have to be stuck in that one version of you that you've built a long time ago. Number two, a personal brand is not just colors and fonts and, and those things. It actually is who you are and your story. So don't just niche into the thing that you talk about. Talk about the things that make you unique. Talk about your life. Talk about the your favorite things. Talk about things other than your niche to make you stand out and make you different. And um, and be consistent. That's the other key that I would give. I think I see a lot of people that are building brands mm -hmm. online and they're using social media, but they're using it for a week and then they're not seeing the results that they want to see. And then they're dropping off for mm -hmm. two weeks and then they're re, re, re emerging two weeks later. And they're like, oh, I took a break from social media, but now I'm back because I was reminded that I should be doing this. I'm going to try again. Unfortunately, uh, building a brand online takes a ton of time and a ton of patience. It looks like it was immediate for a lot of people, but I'm seeing that people are often comparing their chapter one to somebody else's chapter 20. They're comparing their very first post that's not getting any engagement, of course, to somebody that's been doing it for 10 years, that's been doing posting every single day. When I first started doing my Instagram live in the morning, like one person showed up, nobody showed up, but right. I kept doing it and I kept doing it no matter what. And if I would have stopped because no one was showing up, then I wouldn't have gotten to the point where I am now where thousands of people are watching me every single day. But I had to keep going and keep going and keep going. It's persistence, it's consistency. And you need to show your people that are following you that you're gonna be there every single day providing content. And that takes a really long time and it mm. takes patience and it's not an overnight thing. Why do we always compare ourselves with somebody else? Huh? God, <laughs> this is the thing. This is what's holding everybody back. <laughs> This is really good advice. And I 1000% I agree with you on the fact that 
it is very important to build a personal brand now more than ever. I mean, even if you're running a company, right, the consumer behavior has shifted. They, they buy more into personal brands. If you're stating it from a personal brand, they're much more likely to buy it than just a company advertising it. I mean, we've seen it across the board. Uh, what kind of advice would you give to those people? So I'll give you a, a very good example. Let's just say me, for example. I'm not a huge fan of social media. I don't, Vlad is all cool about building his personal brand. I personally hate it, man. Like I, I just, I don't like it. Me personally, we own several companies. It's all behind the scenes. We have a great brand, but you are right at the fact that we are ultimately going to be disadvantaged because we do see a huge consumer behavioral shift of their, you know, we, we spend a ton of money on Facebook ads and social media ads, but the conversions are much better when it's coming from, let's say, influencers or micro influencers, or let's just say in my case, if I were to build a personal brand and say, hey, look, you know, I play the guitar and I do this and I that, and there's a bunch of parents that are following me and they'll buy into our products. What advice would you have it, for me? Is it, do I have to kind of step it up and build a personal brand? Or is it at that point, I go ahead and hire someone to kind of take over the face for our company and build a personal brand there? Sorry for interrupting. Here you can also look at it at a different point of view. If you build it only on your on your personal brand, what's going to happen when you're going to step down or you're going to, I don't know, you're going to die, your company will stay or what will happen? Your company okay. will also die yeah. if your personal brand is not there anymore. So I get to talk to a lot of um, people that are building multiple companies. I've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs that have sold their companies for billions uh, of dollars, that have built massive startups and has raised capital, built their company, exited, and they didn't build a personal brand alongside that company that they were building. They just spent all of their time and energy behind the scenes building this banging company. And they got to the point, like, listen, they don't need to do another thing uh, for the rest of their life if they don't want to, the majority of these right. people. However, the problem is, is that the, if you're an entrepreneur, a purebred entrepreneur, it doesn't matter how much you sell your company for, you want to keep going, you want to do something else. So what I'm, I'm seeing right. two sides here, the person that didn't build the personal brand alongside building the business of who they were and giving advice and just creating content and like basically documenting the journey of being an entrepreneur doesn't necessarily even have to be focused on that business that they're building, just the, the journey of who they are and in their life. The person that didn't do that and exited the company needed to just start from scratch. And they're all calling me saying, Jen, how do I now build this brand? I exited my company for XYZ amount of money. I, I really did it. I'm really the expert, but I, I don't have an audience. And now I want to raise capital to build another company. And these other kids that have built brands that haven't done what I did are raising money faster because they built the brand. What do I do? And I'm like, you got to start from the beginning now. I wish you would have just documented the journey. Now I've also seen several entrepreneurs who did document the journey, who did build the audience alongside it, who did have the personal brand going and they were building the business and then they sold the business and they exited the business and now they're ready to build their next business. Whether that's a consulting business where they go in and they speak and they write books and they consult for people or they wanna raise capital again for another idea that they have, they already have that built in audience of people that love them for them. That goes on with you for life. Right. It's the greatest investment that you could make as a human being is your audience because that's people are following you and so if you let's say let, let's not even talk about you uh, just a, a person that maybe has like a nine to five and you get fired from your job and the next job that you want to get is actually like a really cool startup where you're creating content i'm just making an example you want to be the director of marketing for a cool startup and you're creating content at least you've been building your personal brand for a long time so that they can go see what you've been doing and you already have an audience let's talk about actors Actors are now going into auditions and they're asking, how many followers do you have? They're hiring the actor that has the bigger audience now for the job over the actor that did a better job than them in the audition. And I know that for sure because I've had conversations with people that are like, they're only caring because they want eyeballs. They want someone that has a built in audience. And I know that investors are right. also looking at that when they're, um, when they're, when people are raising capital and when they're investing in companies, I'm looking at that. So what, right. what, so what you're speaking about is building your personal brand, which is not really connected to the business itself. So the business is running even without you. So it's not interconnected. Well, if so you're an well. entrepreneur, right. If you're okay. So I'll just use myself as an example. I have a company called super connector media. We run events. We have a mastermind. We do challenges every single month. We teach. 
and it's an education and events company. And I'm the co-founder of that company. I also have a personal brand that is Jen Gottlieb. I wrote a book. I'm an international keynote speaker. They are completely connected because I'm documenting my life. And my life consists of doing events for my company, Super Connector Media. We've got a great mastermind event coming up in Orlando. I'm documenting that. I've got all of the events that I've done uh, that we're doing virtual events, AI challenge stuff. I'm talking about it on social. So it's connected to my company. Let's say one day I exit Super oh, when Connector you sell Media. It, yeah. We sell Super Connector Media. It's no longer my company. I go to start something else. Fantastic. I evolve into my next thing and all of my followers that follow me and come onto my but live what's going to happen with the me. company? The I don't company know. I'm going to sell it. Maybe I have a buyout. Maybe I'm, that's okay. Maybe I'm still the face. I don't know. I decide then. It doesn't matter. But then I start my next company. My friend, I've got another great example. My friend, Lori Harder. Okay. She's, I invested in her company. She has a female founded startup called Glossy. And she was, she started off as a fitness influencer and she built a personal brand the entire way through. She started off as a fitness influencer. She no longer wanted to talk about that. She wanted to talk about entrepreneurship. She wanted to start a company. She wanted to get female founders. So she started shifting and pivoting her messaging to talk about that, to talk about raising capital as a woman and talk about building a brand. And then she built this company called Light Pink, which was a, um, an alcoholic beverage company. Uh, that didn't end up working out. It actually ended up failing. She lost all of her margins and she had to pivot. So she's pivoting now to a different um, product and she still has her same personal brand. She still does events. She still teaches entrepreneurs. She's taking people along the journey. She's using all of the failures, all of the wins, all of the experiences to help teach people and inspire people. And people are loving being all along the ride for the evolution from when she was a fitness expert right. to when she was an entrepreneur building light pink to when she actually had to pivot and start building a new company called Glossy, which is a skin company, skincare company. And I invested in her. I didn't invest in her because of the idea of the product. I invested in her because I love her as a person. And I love her brand. I love her hunger. I love her drive and I love her overall. So even if she, when she exits Glossy, which she will, which is the company that she's building now, she's going to build something else and I'll still follow her. And, and her whole social media, her personal brand is the evolution of her life that will just shift and change and grow. We evolve as people. Like we, we buy into Beyonce and Lady Gaga and Madonna and they evolve every album. They change into a different version of themselves. Yeah, 100%. Every single musician. We love watching the evolution. Does that make sense, Vlad? I feel like it's more yeah. gray than it is. It's purple. It's not red. It's not blue. It's not black. It's not white. It's purple. It's and. Uh, I don't think it has to be this or that as much anymore in the world that we're living in today, especially with social media. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I, I want to focus a little bit more, uh, more on authenticity. Now, in a recent podcast interview, you mentioned the importance of showcasing your credibility and influence. How do you recommend entrepreneurs or professionals to do this without coming ac across as boastful? Yeah. Um, so I think like you guys do this really well. Like you don't come off boastful at all. And you talk about yourselves and you market yourselves and you've got a podcast. I think that um, my husband always says this to me, actually, he's like, if, if you're worried about being braggy, you're probably not a bragger because people that are mm. right, that are braggers, like they don't worry about bragging. And if you're if you're based in <laughs> service, true. if you're based and you're just focused on helping people, we use the acronym HOPE, help one person every day. And you're really just focusing on helping people. And that's why you're sharing content. That's why you're get going on Instagram. That's why you're going on TikTok. That's why you're going on Facebook. That's why you're creating content is because your why is to help someone and you go online and you create content mm -hmm. focused on that. And you understand that sales is service and you understand that the more that you get yourself out there, the more people you can help and the more that you sell, the more people that you can help. Sales suddenly does not feel sleazy and slimy and braggadocious. It actually mm -hmm. is very much from a service standpoint and it helps also for, right. uh, for me, like I... I used to struggle with that a lot. Like I never used to want to talk about what I did when I first started building my first business. Cause I was like, Oh, I don't want to be salesy or braggy or like talk about myself. I don't like that. That makes me feel uncomfortable. But when I shifted it into, mm -hmm. all right, there's one girl that's listening right now. I'm thinking about her and I'm just going to help her. I'm, I'm going to tell her like what I wish that I would have heard from somebody and I'm going to provide content and value to her and understand and know that if I'm not making myself visible to the person that I can help, they're going to go pay someone else or follow someone else. That's not as good as me and doesn't care as much as me probably because I'm too into mm. myself or worried about being braggy or worried about being salesy. So what we tell people a lot is it's your responsibility to be visible. And if you're worried about being a bragger, that's good news. It means you're never going to come off braggy. Hmm. 
that's a great answer. Yeah. <laughs> I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, Wyatt. I would like to speak about the uh, public speaking. So for those who struggle with the self-confidence, what advice can you give when they go and have like public speaking, how to overcome their fear? Yeah, same thing from what I just said. Um, I find that I always ask people like, do you ever get nervous when you're just at coffee with a friend and they ask you for help and you talk to them? Do you ever forget what to say or get nervous or trip up over your words? They're always like, no, because I, I know I don't. Like if we if we were all just sitting at lunch and you were like, oh, could you give me advice on social media or whatever I talk about? I'd be like, sure, let's go. I'll help you right now. And I would I would be able to speak totally perfectly and probably give you a great keynote speech, right? <laughs> Helping you. But for some right. reason, when we get on stage, we get all scared and we get nervous. And that's totally normal. I think that's like the number one biggest fear in the world or something, or the number two biggest fear, a uh, common, com like common fear is public speaking. And I believe it's because we are so worried about what people will think of us and what we look like and what we sound like. And if we're good enough and we're focusing on the wrong thing, because when you're sitting at lunch with a friend and they need advice and you're helping that friend, you're not thinking about yourself. You're just thinking mm -hmm. about your friend and that's why right. you're not nervous. So I use this exact same concept, help one person every day. Think about the person in the audience that you're providing value to, whoever it is. I always, whenever, before I speak, I always think about one person in the audience. I don't just speak to that one person because that'd be a shitty keynote, but I think about that one person. <laughs> and I think that I'm just talking to them and I'm having a conversation with them and I'm helping them. And it helps me to remove my ego and I just, I'm just like, just provide value. It's not about me. It's about helping that one person. And that helps to remove the nerves. It doesn't completely remove the nerves. They're always there a little bit. And that goes back to the topic we were talking about earlier, where you want to put your arm around the fear, put your arm around the anxiety, bring it along with you, embrace it, and then just let go. And like I say, I say, God speak to me and through me and trust and know that I can provide value to one person in this room. And that always helps me. Yeah, thank you. That's great. That's great advice. Uh, you know, before before the interview, um, I was going through the questions and it reminded me my story. I want to speak about creating before having principle. So in one of the interviews, you mentioned that uh, like you was meditating and you creating your future husband in your mind before meeting Chris. And it reminded me my story because it's kind of same. I was meditating for a long time to imagine my wife, my kids, how my kids would look like. And actually everything happened, you know, exactly how I was imagining my kids. They even look same as in my meditation. So could you please elaborate on this principle? How did you do that? I love that. Congrats. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So I talk about it in the book a lot uh, and I call it the creation process. And many people will think of it at uh, like manifestation or manifesting or visualizing what you want. Uh, I like to call it co-creating, co-creating with the universe. And I believe that's what you did, Vlad. You co-created. And I don't think uh, you got all of those magical things because you just visualized them and they appeared because you visualized them. I don't think so. I believe that the way that that works is visualization is one of the many tools that we can use to help reprogram our subconscious mind and reprogram our beliefs. Because our actions that we take in life are really dictated by our subconscious beliefs, what we believe we're capable of doing, right? Like if we're too scared to go up to that that person at the bar and talk to them and say hi and give them your number. Uh, if you believe that you're not good enough to do that, you're never going to do it. And then that might hold you back from meeting your soulmate forever because you have that limiting belief or that fear that you can't go up to somebody and talk to them. But if you have visualized night after night after night that you are in love, in this amazing relationship, you are like so happy. For me, when I was doing that with my, before I met my husband, Chris, uh, similar to you, Vlad, I would visualize uh, being with him, taking walks with him. I would have conversations with him. And what that did was it reprogrammed my subconscious to believe that I was in a relationship, to believe that I was capable of this, to believe that it was real for me. And it helped me to be a lot less afraid of it, of calling someone in, of having conversations with people, of going on dates. And it helped make the action steps a lot easier. And when you reprogram the subconscious to believe that you have something before it's already yours, it makes the opportunities for getting that thing a lot more noticeable. And it's like, oh yeah, wait, I did that in my mind. I think I'm going to go do that now. Or like when I met my husband on the first day, I was like, oh, here he is. I recognized him and I was able to accept him and bring him in rather than pushing him away like I might have done if I didn't do that before. Mm. You know, I love the point that you have to do action because a lot of people, they just want to manifest, meditate and do shit. They just 
waiting until it's going to happen. No way. Just get up, go and do something at least towards your manifestation, whatever you was hoping for. Yes, we're on the same page. It takes action. There's a section in my book called The Law of Action. You cannot have the law of attraction without action. And if you look back a lot, I'm sure you could look at all of the moments that you had to take action on something in order to, to get your wife. Like I know you probably had to do a lot of scary things. And I bet you that your visualizing helped you subconsciously or subconsciously be able to take action to do all of those things. Uh, and I'm sure that it, like that it's your, it was your tool to get you to yeah. take action. How many kids do you have? Two. Two. Two kids. Yeah. Beautiful. Six and three. Ah, oh, congrats. So Jen, since we're talking about your book, congrats, of course, on your book. I know it was just released not even a month ago, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a huge hit. So congrats Thank on you. that. Uh, we're talking about your book titled Be Seen. What, I want to very briefly ask, who is this book for? What is the takeaway messages that you you hope your readers uh, will take away from this book? Yeah. Well, I, when I was writing my book, I was practicing the HOPE acronym. I really thought about the person I was writing it for, that one person, and I wrote it for them. And when you read the book, you're going to hear uh, that it's very conversational. It actually sounds like we're sitting at a coffee shop together and I'm just talking to you because it's very much in my voice because that's how I wanted it to sound because I was literally, I'm not a writer, I'm a speaker. So I was speaking into the keyboard and, and talking to my person. But the person that I wrote this book for um, is is the person that has a dream that maybe is too afraid to start living it. And whether that is a dream of mm. building a brand online and becoming the recognized expert and helping millions of people, or maybe it's just allowing their friends and family to see them as who they really are so that they can start living a life that feels fulfilled and free. It's really somebody that feels a little invisible. Maybe they feel like they've been creating this life that other people wanted for them for so long and they woke up one day and they're like, what is this? What am I doing? This is not me. I did this for everybody else and now I'm being seen as something that's inauthentic and I really want to start being who I am so I can create the life that I really desire. Or maybe it's the person that's like, okay, I figured it out. I know who I am, but I'm just too afraid to show the world. I'm too afraid to put myself out there. I'm too afraid to put to, for, to do video, to, do, uh, to post because I'm scared of what other people will think. And my goal with this book is to just be someone's cheerleader. I want that book to be your cheerleader, to be mm. your buddy, to be with you alongside you as you do it so that you can start taking action, Vlad, the most important piece. And at the end of each chapter, I give everybody an action step. I give everybody a win, a quick win they can do. So it's something that you can do at the end of that chapter that'll move you forward a little bit. So it's not just a sitting around reading it. It's a very actionable book. Uh, so I really want it mm. to be your buddy along your journey to help you start being seen in whatever that means to you. That sounds fantastic. We look forward to reading your book, Jen. Before I let you go, I have one last question, which we ask every single guest on the show. The question is, who has been one of the most strongest or inspiring people in your life and what lessons have you learned from them? Oh, my husband, Chris, for sure. <laughs> uh, Great answer. <laughs> yeah, no question. Uh, he he's he's taught me the majority of the things that I know about business and marketing and uh, the majority of the things mm. that I know about networking as well. When I met Chris, I was a very slow decision maker. I took a long time to do everything. I was very much mm. in an action. I, was, uh, I would overanalyze everything. I would be afraid to take action and talk to people. I would be afraid to market myself. I would be afraid to be visible. And he is my business partner in Super Connector Media. And we built this together because we both have our separate strengths. But a lot of the strengths that I've developed now, I've only developed as a result of him being my mentor and teaching me all of these things. And I'm not saying that you guys all need to marry someone that can become your mentor. I was very blessed in order to do that. Uh, but find somebody that can be your mentor because I've grown so much. I, knowing what I didn't know and being open enough to learn, even if he has to like pull it out of me, which sometimes has to happen. He has to force me to do things and I resist it because of course, like we resist from our significant other. But um, yeah, if you don't follow my husband, Chris Winfield, he's an AI expert and, um, he's the, he's the backbone of this entire company. And, uh, if he, his nudges and his expertise and his mentorship and his teachings to me, um, are a lot of what I, what I do and the reason that I do what I do and, and the reason that I was able to really fully start being seen as, as my fullest, most authentic version of myself and that I'm still mm. growing into. So for sure, hands down. Thank, thank you for sharing that. 
that's why we love that question because it kind of gives a deeper insight into you instead of you know some of the questions. Jen, thank you so much for spending some time with us again. Uh, for those of you who are interested, please be sure to check out Jen's new published and released book called "Be Seen: Find Your Boy." Find your voice, build your brand, live your dream. And of course, you can find that on uh, any kind of uh, retail channels like Amazon, Barnes & Noble. And I, I know you also have a website, Jen. Do you want to quickly mention that? Sure. BeSeenBook.com. They can go there too. Okay. Fantastic. Jen, it has been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You guys are amazing. So fun. Thank you.